I don't think I want to speak after that introduction. Thank um, you. But could you flip the switch, Russ? Flip the switch. Which to where? Down one. Down one. Or up one. To B. Try that. That's there cool. we go. Good. Um, thank you, Bill. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the deployment of the DNS security protocol, and uh, this presentation is a uh, combined work of, from uh, my left, Rob Alstein, Suresh Krishnaswamy, and Russ Mundy, and I are the, uh, the ones who take the hit for this uh, presentation. It actually uh, represents uh, a somewhat larger effort where the, the essence of this whole um, project that we're going to describe here is a community uh, building exercise to try to get everybody moving in the same direction and untangle the problems that uh, occur in the process. So let me walk through the pieces of this. First of all, um, the view is that there are actually some real threats um, that DNS security can be helpful in addressing. Here's a handful of them listed. Uh, it's possible to get into um, serious arguments about are these all the threats, are these threats real, um, how many of them are being exploited these days. Um, such a discussion can go off tracks. Um, weird versions of it are how can we stimulate more attacks so that we can demonstrate uh, the necessity of DNS security. I don't want to go there. Uh, but there is a um, th there is a bunch of data that says there's spoofing of very sorts of DNS and there are opportunities to do more violence um, waiting to happen. Uh, DNS security was once upon a time an extremely urgent immediate problem. Uh, there were some demonstrations in the early 90s that led to uh, concern at high levels in the US government uh, which resulted in very quick uh, action. Uh, Vitsurf called me up urgently one day and said we've got to fix this and we started a major project and uh, the project continued and continued and continued. The specifications have gone through three major cycles and are now finally uh, in See, what's the official uh, status? They've made it past last call and have been sent to the RFC editor uh, through the ISG. So that's essentially done except for the publication cycle, which also takes forever. Uh, there's been some big strides to make DNS security uh, operationally viable in these iterations. So, for example, one of the big changes was um, the relationship of a parent zone to a child zone, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, was too tight before and led to uh, great operational difficulties whenever changes needed to be made. Now that's been uh, set apart enough so that uh, the pieces can be updated more independently. Uh, there's been a lot of time spent making the specs more robust and now a, a coordinated global effort to grow the uh, deployed base. So we're hopeful uh, despite some people who looked at this whole process from a distance and say it's taken too long and um, <coughs> excuse me, we don't know if it's ever going to happen. We're hopeful that this is actually the time, but it, it's not going to happen completely on its own. There's uh, too many parts that have to be put together. What does uh, DNSSEC uh, provide? It's a protocol extension to uh, the domain name system protocol that provides for data integrity and origin uh, authentication, and even a uh, authentication of the denial of the existence of certain records. That has some interesting unintended consequences, but it allows the end user or the, or the systems close to the end user to verify that the data, uh, the binding between, uh, principally between a, a domain name and an IP address um, is what was intended by the um, group or person who created that binding and cannot have been modified uh, in transit or in storage uh, without detection. Certainly modified, but uh, this provides a way of detecting that that's been um, changed or that uh, somebody is trying to supply you with incorrect data um, and, and spoof you. Uh, it fits together with uh, some surrounding protocols, there are, as you, as you will see, we'll have some diagrams, 
uh, some of the raw data has to be put in in the first place, um, and there are some last mile issues. How do you uh, transfer this information among the uh, uh, parts of the system that are not DNSSEC aware? DNSSEC doesn't pro intend to provide any confidentiality of the data, uh, and it doesn't actually provide, um, it's not intended to provide any direct attack against uh, denial of service attacks, uh, direct protection against denial of service attacks. Both of those uh, lead to some fairly intricate and uh, detailed discussions. If we have time, I'll be happy to uh, uh, engage in those discussions. So here's what the end-to-end -end protection looks like. Uh, you have a trusted key, is this, yeah, this shows, you have a trusted key uh, at the top and it signs the zone for uh, the top level domain and then there is a, um, uh, a, a DS key for signing the, um, uh, the key for the next zone and so forth uh, on down. So you have a hierarchy of keys and there's actually a pair of keys at each level, uh, one that signs uh, the individual entries within the zone and one that is signing the uh, the key signing key, if you will, for the for the uh, for the whole zone. And that double key arrangement is what provides the uh, manageability for making changes within a zone without having that um, trickle up uh, to the parent zone and cause a tremendous set of changes. Here's what DNS operations look like in an unsigned environment. You have an unsigned child zone and an unsigned parent zone. Uh, and glue information, and then the parent zone, uh, uh, whenever there's a change made, reloads the parent zone, and um, this uh, not very happy child is waiting uh, for the correct uh, information to appear. In DNSSEC operations, things are a bit more complex because keys have to be generated and then used for assigning the elements of the uh, zone and then uh, that information has to be exchanged, preferably in a secure fashion, else um, some of the uh, protection provided falls apart, provided to the parent zone who then signs the, um, uh, that entry in the parent zone pointing to the child zone, and then there is the propagation, publication and propagation of uh, that information. Um, missing here, ah, and uh, a, sec an ex a secure exchange of information. So uh, now I'm going to look briefly at several points of view and see what has to change. So from the registrant's point of view, that's uh, typically an enterprise, what's different? Well, they have to have key generation and key management. Uh, they have to engage in their own zone signing operations and they have to provision the name server and they have to have a way of securely transmitting the DNSSEC related information to the registrar. Um, and all of that, excuse me, all of that only gets the uh, zone signed and uh, the, the, uh, the, the signatures propagated, but uh, to, be, uh, to be really useful, they should actually check signatures from time to time. Uh, I'm being somewhat facetious, they should check them all the time. So you have to have validating resolvers, um, that uh, provide uh, uh, security checking. And then every once in a while something goes wrong or there are updates and so forth, so incident handling is required. From the registrar's point of view, uh, that information, you have the complementary side of it. The information has to be received from the registrant and then has to be transmitted into the registry. And, uh, and of course, there will be a need for handling uh, changes and incidents and so forth. From the registry point of view, uh, several things need to be done. Obviously, uh, receiving the information from the registrar, uh, creating the secure delegation in the parent zone, uh, managing the key and key management uh, operations. Um, every time we talk about key generation and key management, we're talking about public-private key um, kinds of operations, and protecting the private key is obviously a, a very strong concern. Uh, leading to lots of um, discussions, some of which are pragmatic and some of which are religious about uh, uh, what kinds of risks are appropriate or what you do um, when you're nervous about that. Um, there are some operational issues in that uh, the size of a signed record is substantially larger. Uh, we don't have accurate 
precise measurements, but it's uh, but the numbers are range from three to five times as big, depending upon uh, various parameters of the signing, so that each record in the zone is is that much bigger, and of course, so that takes up space, and of course, when transmitting that record, that takes up uh, the same um, additional amount of bandwidth. Um, so this. Uh, put some pressure uh, from an operational point of view on capacity, uh, both uh, storage and bandwidth on these name servers. Uh, some question as to how important that is, and it will depend greatly on whether we're talking about relatively small name servers or uh, ones operating at the top end of the spectrum. So that's a discussion for which the people who run .com have very strong feelings of one kind and uh, people at the other end of the tail um, may have very different kinds of feelings, for example. Uh, oh, and, 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 and I guess that's just after the zone is signed. There's also the, the non-trivial question of the computational power required to create the signatures in the first place. Uh, signing operations typically are uh, computationally intensive, and um, it's not a big deal if you don't have very many, but it is a big deal if you have millions of, um, of records to sign. Uh, and that leads then to a bifurcation of, well, are we doing this offline or are we trying to sign things in real time? And uh, obviously it's a lot better if you can get this job done uh, offline and then provision those signed records. But then uh, what do you do when you have to make changes? And then there's a more detailed discussion related to um, uh, the, the authenticated, um, authentic uh, delivering up authenticated denial of existence of records. So if you ask, if the query asks for something that's not in the uh, zone, um, the uh, spec says give back a record that uh, uh, declares authoritatively that that um, uh, entry doesn't exist. And one of the ways to do it, and the, the sort of expected way to do it, is to deliver up a um, a span, uh, an entry that says everything between uh, alpha and beta, it doesn't exist, um, assuming that alpha is, the first, is an entry and beta is the next entry in there, uh, and then that would cover everything that is not in, that's in that, that gap, if you will. The problem with that is it enables um, a very uh, relatively efficient walking of the zone, which really is some privacy problems, and uh, if you follow down that um, uh, thread, a, uh, a possible response is, well, let's make up uh, less informative uh, gap entries that are narrower and are computed on the spot for each uh, query, but then that puts a computational load on, the, uh, on those name servers because of the cost of the crypto operation. So there's a, a series of um, not fully resolved kinds of questions that are still trading off computation versus uh, security and privacy issues in a uh, uh, sort of still bubbling fashion. Um, tools are all important here. Uh, there are some tools that uh, handle generation of keys and that has uh, checked zones and signed the, the zones. And there are some authoritative name server implementations and there are some security aware uh, recursive name server implementations, but there is not a full suite fully populated for everybody. So one of the things to track over a period of time, and, and I would say mm, within a relatively short period of time, talks of coming from us and of this, of this type will start to have uh, inventories and um, uh, measures of how complete the tool sets are and what's available. Um, Here's a picture of tools that are both present and missing. This is a, a, a complete picture, and here's where the tools fit in, all, all the elements in green. So we have uh, key generation tools, zone signing and checking tools, um, and the name server uh, serving and checking kinds of tools. Uh, there also has to be extensions to the uh, protocol between the registrar and the registry uh, that fit into uh, the EPP uh, protocol. So extensions are being completed uh, to facilitate this. This will serve uh, primarily the GTLD uh, community, uh, which is working with um, large numbers of registrars. 
Um, let's see, there's also uh, some out of band tools that are required to move the key set file um, uh, within the registrant and over to the registrar. Um, more work is going on creating tools and troubleshooting. Uh, a substantial amount of work is needed on documentation and training and policy guidance uh, at the point where an enterprise says, hmm, I've heard about this DNS security protocol, uh, what does it do? Somebody has to, um, there has to be some material available to answer that question. And then the next question that that um, possible adopter is going to ask, okay, so I'm convinced that we're going to need this. Um, how are my people going to implement this? Part of that question is what tools are available, but the another part of that is uh, how do my people understand what this is, what's the training, what's the procedures, how do I adopt it into uh, uh, my operation. Um, a whole separate question has to do with uh, a very long adoption cycle. We're in a stage now where there is essentially um, you know, very close to zero zones that have been signed. So this is a very easy stage to manage. Nothing's happening. Uh, eventually, there will be uh, a very substantial number of zones that are signed and uh, very common DNSSEC aware uh, resolvers. But in the interim, we're going to have a, a very clumsy mixture of partial of some zones that are signed and, and many zones that are unsigned and some resolvers that are DNSSEC aware and some that are not. What do you do if you make a request for a signed uh, entry and an unsigned entry comes back? Do you trust it anyway? Well, today the answer had better be yes because that's as good as you're going to get. Uh, down the, the line when most things are, so, are signed, the answer may be no. A more um, uh, useful intermediate position is you may have reason to believe that certain zones are signed and if you get back an unsigned answer then you should be suspicious of it. Where would such a reason come from? Uh, so the notion of trust anchors exist where there's uh, multiple zones that are signed that are not necessarily connected to parents because the parents are not yet in a position to be signed. And so the tops of each of those um, uh, islands, if you will, uh, becomes a separate trust anchor. And then that then leads to the operational question of how do you find out uh, what all the useful trust anchors are. This is in a sense related to the PTP key signing kind of uh, uh, regimen where you have uh, out of band uh, bilateral arrangements or uh, known servers that people can deposit their, um, their keys in. Another uh, area where work is underway is in, to address the uh, so-called zone walking problem uh, where too much information is exposed about what's in the zone. Once upon a time, it was uh, expected that entire contents of the zone should be public to anybody anytime uh, with no restriction. Over the last uh, many years, there's been growing sensitivity toward the disclosure of the entire contents of the zone even though Quite obviously, each entry is there to be exposed to anybody who asks for it. So it's an aggregation question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a side effect of the current uh, protocol plus a, uh, expected implementation is that it makes it easy to walk through a zone and discover each and every entry in a relatively efficient way. Uh, and there are now some um, uh, subsequent investigations as to whether there are uh, ways to thwart that or alternative implementations. Um, there's uh, enterprise-wide experiments underway, um, trying out uh, the DNSSEC software that is emerging, uh, workshops for uh, operators and, and others, and a, uh, it's not quite the case that there are no sign zones. There's a handful, uh, and people are getting some experience with that. Uh, I mentioned EPP extensions for a DNSSEC, so it allows registrars uh, with different operational models to access uh, the different uh, registries using the same protocol. There's also uh, uh, provisioning work in progress and, uh, and other experiments. So that's a emerging area to follow. Scott Hollenbeck uh, from uh, VeriSign is, uh, holds the pen on the spec there and doing quite a bit of work. 
Uh, here's the locations of some of the uh, registry level experiments. Uh, Netherlands and Sweden are uh, very far out in front on a lot of this work. There is uh, work in Japan. Um, there's a DNSSEC pilot that Verisign is uh, working on. And there is work on uh, something, a, a portion of the trust anchor problem that um, uh, is being experimented with in a number of uh, uh, settings. Um, here are some application level experiments for, uh, that make use of DNSSEC. One of the most often asked questions is, okay, what can I do with this that I couldn't do before? Uh, in effect, DNSSEC provides a, uh, a version of a public key hierarchy without all of the um, um, uh, intensity of trying to nail down the identity of individuals more focused on uh, nailing down, if you will, the identity of the servers and, um, and, and a chain of responsibility for them and stopping at that point. So that gives you a, a very light form of a public key infrastructure, um, which is useful for a broad class of applications, but not, but not everything. That's not, uh, it's not gonna be sufficient for um, um, authenticating an individual user to a bank, for example, but it may be adequate for getting a handle on whether or not it's really your bank or somebody spoofing Citibank or uh, whoever the uh, bank du jour is today for spam. Uh, short list of some of the, uh, uh, the problems that we're still wrestling with. As I mentioned, privacy, which was not originally a goal. Um, who signs the root key and what are all the procedures to manage the key at the root? This is not technically a very hard uh, or interesting problem taken by itself. Uh, just the extraordinary level of visibility and um, uh, multiple agendas that attend to that make that uh, an interesting problem as well. Uh, are there any applications that uh, fit together with DNSSEC so that uh, it would serve as a major um, uh, accelerator or uh, to propel that into a must-have situation? Uh, possibly, we're still waiting for uh, specifics to emerge. And then um, I mentioned trust anchors. Uh, it's not so bad if you have one, two, three, ten, twenty, fifty trust anchors. It gets hard if you have hundreds and thousands of trust anchors, then you have a whole new system. Uh, if one examines the sort of the natural arc, we're going to start with a very small number of trust anchors. It's going to grow, and eventually uh, the need for separate trust anchors will disappear as the tree is filled in, and it's that intermediate stage where the tree is not very well filled in, but there's still enough there uh, that we don't know quite how messy all that's going to get. Uh, here's some resources. I think these slides are uh, available online, so there's uh, no need to scribble very hard. And um, that's the quick tour through the DNSSEC deployment activities uh, today. We have time for questions. Um, any questions? Sam, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> I would expect Sam Weiler to stand up here. Since I'm already up here, I can ask some questions. But uh, Spencer, uh, you have this August panel. You can ask him. You don't have to ask Steve. He's already talked a lot. And uh, I'll ask the August panel. Uh, I noticed that we just had the pres presentation that was talking about uh, larger resource records and the increased incidence of truncation and TCP retrievals, which may succeed or may fail. Where are you guys in thinking that through? Is it, is it a concern? Yeah, it is. Um, the thing is that there are enough code changes required for DNSSEC anyway that what we ended up doing was saying you have to support eDNS0 in order to do DNSSEC. There just is no other way. Uh, and there, there are a couple of reasons for that. The size issue is one of them. Go ahead, Russ. 
Well, yeah, as Rob said, eDNS Zero is really essential for the success of, of DNS security deployment because uh, the, the talk before that was talking about describing what would happen and falling back to TCP, uh, frankly, that's, that's just an untenable uh, solution and, and won't work. Uh, there is one thing to note in that context, though. The way that the protocol works, you don't have to upgrade every stub resolver in the world to start getting the benefits of this. So it's not like you have to have EDNS zero and all the stub resolvers. Uh, it's the protocol from the verifying resolvers, sorry, the validating resolvers up to the authoritative name servers where you need EDNS zero. The rest of it, it's optional. It's probably a good idea, but you don't strictly need it. Thanks, Bill. This is Sam Weiler. Um, I didn't hear a specific list of what you want the people in this room to do. What would you like for them to do, and why is it safe to do that? Those are two different questions, of course. <laughs> um, Take them in order. I want, uh, let's see, what do I want the people in this room to do? Hmm. Uh, learn to spell DNSSEC would be the first thing. Uh, uh, more, more seriously, uh, I think two things. One is um, focus attention on DNSSEC uh, as if it were real and think about implementation and what it takes to either do it or to um, cause the organizations that you're working with to do it. And the other side of that is feedback and participation. Uh, identify what the issues are, uh, whether they're resource issues uh, or uh, technical problems or operational problems or missing tools or missing documents and so forth and, and get involved uh, and be vocal about that. So those are the two things to do that. Now, uh, why is it safe? Well, uh, you can trust us. I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> let, let me make one additional, uh, hello? Okay. One additional uh, response there, and that is the, Steve mentioned earlier that, that this is actually the third basic design of, the, of, of how we're going to do validation of DNS information. And, and quite frankly, the reason the first two designs weren't, the biggest single reason that they weren't successful is they did not take enough into consideration what the operational realities were. As we've gone through this particular redesign, there's been a, a tremendously larger amount of involvement in the from the operational community. But we need more. We want to get all the feedback we possibly can. We'd love to have people uh, practice uh, signing some zones right now. We have some, experience, some experiments ongoing. And anybody that, that would consider just running a sign zone for a bit, um, get in touch with any one of us. And uh, we'll, we will happily. Uh, work with additional folks to uh, start actually going through the mechanics of, of running sign zones so that everybody learns more as we go forward. And one of the important things to do is for us that are trying to get it deployed is to get it in, worked into your normal workflow, whatever your normal workflow is, and, and to make it as, as little disruption as possible. And so to do that, we really want to get additional input from people as to how they actually do go about running their zones today. Yeah, so, so start thinking about how you would actually do this in your ops procedures. Yeah. Leave the mics on. So uh, my answer to Sam's question would be, we need to know what the ops procedures are for this stuff. And it's not we sitting up here at the front of the room do, but in order for this to work, the people actually running systems out there need to think through how they're going to use this and tell us whether or not we screwed up. You know, what, does this fit into your workflow? Can it be made to fit into your workflow? Is there some better way we should have done it? Uh, what, what's the procedure for this? Have you got all the pieces in place to actually securely get the information from here to there? Can you make this follow your existing authentication, your, your existing authorization paths, uh, where you've got you've already got some kind of a relationship? Uh, between the customer and the database that the data is going into. Can you make this follow that, all that kind of stuff? It just needs to be thought through. We, we've done um, as much as we can. But. Okay. Uh, while Mark is uh, trying to stand up there and, and ask another question, I would like Michael to come on up and get prepped for your presentation next. Um, very short 
questions and even shorter replies, because I do want the last word. Uh, uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, Mark Coster's VeriSign, uh, and this is more of a sort of a plea. We've had, uh, we talked about op operations are actually starting to look at DNS second and deploying it, and a lot of it's from the registry side. But we've had, we've not had a lot of success on doing sort of recursive name server management. And that's where you actually play a big part of, because many of you run some very, very large recursive uh, name server farms. And information coming back from that would be extremely useful. What he said. OK, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, further questions, grab any one of them in the hall. One of the things. While he's getting set up, I'm going to use this microphone. Let me just move out of the way. I will use I will use this microphone because you can't hear me otherwise. Um, one of the things that Steve was talking about <laughs> DNSSEC and registries and forward stuff. Remember that the other side of the DNS is the reverse map, and as ISPs, you have address blocks that you manage. So think about how you would deal with the key management issues and those things for the addresses that you're assigned. So that it, it may, in fact, be more applicable than you might have thought in the past. So again, uh, last round of applause for these guys. Get them off the stage. <laughs>